Today's episode with Robert Kopecki is another um, talk during the International Association for Near-Death Studies. So it is a little bit longer than usual, but I know you're going to find this information just fascinating and inspiring. And just a quick reminder to check out my first children's book, Love Magic. It's on amazon.com. Enjoy the show. Today, I am really excited to have Robert Kopecki on the show. I followed Robert for a while now, and I recently listened to his his inspiring talk at the International Association for Near-Death Studies. So I reached out to Robert to ask him if he would share, share this talk with us. And he said yes. So I'm so excited that you're here today, Robert. Robert escaped a traumatic childhood growing up on the edge of San Diego, California, and went on to travel extensively, living a variety of lives as a ski bum, a factory welder, a monumental sculptor fabricator, an underground cartoonist, and finally as an award-winning Manhattan illustrator, art director, and animation designer for clients like the New York Times, Cartoon Network, and PBS Kids. His global journeys from the remote South Pacific and the Mayan underworld to the media centers in Manhattan were punctuated by three very different dramatic near-death experiences that eventually led him to years of study, meditation, and service, and the transpersonal realization of a life beyond that inspired him to write about the spiritual lessons he'd learned the hard way. When the spiritual essays he posted on his design blog became more popular than his designs, he was called to write his book, How to Survive Death. After that, he was known as a near-death experiencer, as a speaker, teacher, and contributing writer featured on Gaia, The Mindful World, Inner Self, Belief Net, and more. His latest book, How to Get to Heaven Without Really Dying, Wisdom from a Near-Death Survivor, released in 2018, is a comprehensive guide to experiencing experiencing heaven in this life. Today, I am so excited to have Robert on the show. His multiple near-death experiences give him a unique perspective on the phenomena of the afterlife, as well as on the life we currently live. Welcome to the program, Robert. Uh, thank you so much, Marla. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for yes. having me. I just have a quick question. Did your near, near-death experiences, did did that inspire you? Were you doing art before before then? Yeah, I've always been an artist. I, okay. I'm a person who didn't have to learn how to draw. You know? So when I was a little kid, my life just kind of sent me in that direction because I could earn a living doing that. So yes, yes. I went to art school and became an illustrator and, and uh, art director and graphic designer and stuff when I was quite young. Um, so the near-death experiences didn't really have anything to, to do with that so right. much. Right. You know. Yeah, I was just curious. I just um, interviewed David Ditchfield the other day and, of course, Tony Sicoria, who are savants after their NDE. So I was just kind of curious about that. So today, um, let's... Let's just, I'm going to let you go for it. I'm sure I'll interject because I almost always do. And your presentation at the IONS conference was how NDEs are spiritual technology and timeless lessons of my three near death experiences. Did I get that right? That's right. Yeah. For the for the non technologically minded, I like to throw in. Yes, too. yes, exactly. So I will just let you take it away. Okay, yeah, I, I, and I add that for the non-technologically minded. Um, thank you, Marla. Uh, I add that for the non-technologically minded because there are some experts on those issues that can talk to you about um, the sort of quantum interface that might be suggested by near-death experience. And there are some great teachers along those lines whose work I love. Um, I'm talking more about a kind of spiritual technology that is at work in our life that you may have noticed uh, that you don't have to read books about physics and stuff to understand. When you see synchronicities and that kinds of thing, 
And having had the three near-death experiences and each one being different, um, like totally different, um, that led me to, um, along with the experience of being part of the near-death experience community after my first book came out and hearing all these other stories and the, such a wide range of them, to try to kind of figure out what was consistent in all of them, uh, what all of this could mean, you know, what it's talking, what it's telling us is going on here. And so um, I like to, uh, I like to go through my three experiences and point out what the uh, lessons were that I learned from them and how they uh, kind of inform this apparent spiritual technology that's at work uh, in any life you're living. That sort of thing. So, my main point really is that as human beings, uh, we we have a misperception problem. You know, it's very easy for us to be feel trapped, and in a way, we are trapped in this life and in this world. Uh, before we get here, it's uh, I don't know for for certain, but I have a pretty strong suspicion that we are part of a much larger um, field of divine consciousness and possibility and who knows exactly what our lives are before. There are people that can help you find that, make those kinds of discoveries for yourself too. But um, when you're in this life, you're constrained by, by being a human. And there's so much stuff happening, so much sensory stuff. You know, you get so wound up about everything that it's very difficult to understand that we are six sensory beings, that we're probably, I know, uh, interdimensional beings as well. We're just here in this, put in this form right now for this time being. Uh, so, uh, going off of that, you know, I, I like you said in the in the lead up, I was pretty much kind of like a regular guy who uh, <laughs> didn't expect to have anything like this happen at all in my life, and I really hadn't thought about it very much. Um, but when they happened. Over the course of about 15 years, my life kept kind of getting kicked or rebooted in a way that I kept kind of denying. I kept struggling against it. And you'll hear this story from a lot of near-death experiencers, too, that it's difficult to kind of come back and have things work quite the same way. And it really wasn't until uh, about, um, well, I guess about three or four years after the last near-death experience I had, that I was actually present at, at uh, 9-11. I was living in New York at the time. And I had this kind of extra dimensional experience of spirits, you know, loosed. And it was like, okay, I'm, I'm paranormal. I give up. <laughs> and uh, I ended up getting a little uh, cottage on the upper Delaware River and actually sat on a rock by the river for a long time and developed a, uh, a very deep meditation process. Uh, and worked that for years before um, I started posting these kind of um, uh, inspired, you might say, or it's almost like channeled uh, in a way, because I'd come up from my rock, I'd write an essay, I'd post it on my, um, on my design blog that I had at the time. And then, you know, like you said in my intro, those became those posts became much more popular than any of my design posts. And I got contacted by, by Gaia and people like that to, to write for them. Um, so that led to my first book, uh, How to Survive Life and Death, which is really about um, death and dying to help people with issues of death and dying uh, with, when others die or if they're afraid of it themselves. Uh, it's the the theme of it is I'm uh, the Woody Allen quote. I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> right? That's that's the quote that launches that book. And then how to get to heaven without really dying came after I was part of the of the community, the whole community, and was really uh, exploring more what heaven is, what the other side is, and the fact that in my experience, heaven is not a location or an address. It is a state of being, and it's a state of being that is possible here in this life. And we all know that because we've all experienced a little piece of heaven at one time or another, right? Um, 
so the the theme of that book is a, is a quote from the Gospel of Thomas, which is the kingdom of heaven is spread across the earth, but men don't have eyes to see it, which uh-huh. might be gender specific. <laughs> but it's that it's all here now, and when you die and move on to the afterlife and to another world, you don't know what you're going to meet there. So I'll tell you about my three experiences, and you can see that my experiences were all quite different and the lessons that I learned from them. Um, I, like I was mentioning to you earlier, I try to keep these, uh, these stories exactly the way they were the day after they happened. Um, because I've had things that have informed them d- more deeply over the years, but I know that, uh, that, that human memory is, you know, that's one of our constraints. That's problematic. Uh, that it can, um, it not it can't be completely reliable, and so I don't trust my own memory for um, sort of additional aspects of the stories. Just just for the actual story itself, I had an out of body experience, I had a life review, and I had a forced return into life. So the um, the out of body experience, the first one, uh, happened when I was. Um, I had dropped my wife off at the time I was living in Los Angeles, and I was an art director and illustrator. And I was uh, coming home from the airport on an unfamiliar road. And to to give you an idea of when this was, how long ago this was, I had a a misfunction with my cassette player in my car. (laughs) My, My cassette tape got eaten by my player. And so I popped it out and messed around with it. And I didn't realize that the street that I was on did not continue going straight. And as I just was just for an instant uh, pulled aside, looking at, you know, pulling the tape out kind of thing, there was an oddly parked vehicle that I glanced off of and I went right into a utility pole, like a telephone pole. Going about 35 miles an hour or so, not real fast, but fast enough to break out the windshield and break the steering wheel with uh, my head and face. And um, even though I had a a harness, a shoulder harness on at the time. And then the next instant, the very next instant, I found myself at the top of the telephone pole. I didn't, I wasn't aware of me being a body. It wasn't like I was swimming up there and I was trying to hold on to anything. I just was present. I could see, but I wasn't aware of having a body. And I felt uh, what you'll hear all near-death experiencers talk about, which is this kind of dissolution into a greater field of love, this kind of enveloping in this this sense of, of love, of being contained in, of being part of a greater mind, too, of not having the limitations of thought, not being subject to sort of serial thought the same way. And as I looked down, I saw the car that I'd been driving smashed into the telephone pole and an arm hanging out of the window. I could look over uh, the um, foliage and stuff in people's yards and see into like to the their side door and their porch open up and people come out because they'd heard the crash. Um, it was dusk and the light went on on the uh, on the lamp post. And there was a moth flying around it. You know, those are the things that I distinctly remember. People coming out and, uh, um, you know, circling the the wreck and saying, call an ambulance, which they did. And I was kind of trying to um, levitate downwards. It was sort of what it ended up being. Get closer to them to let them know that I was there. But uh, nobody noticed at all. And I had this sense that I was not alone, that it seemed as though there were somebody with me over my left shoulder um, that was kind of keeping me there. And the ambulance came and they put my body into the car and drove off with it. And I couldn't contact, I couldn't talk to anybody at all. And at that moment, I got this like, it's time to go. Kind of thing, you know, let's go. And being shepherded away from that scene, sort of into a bank, a cloud bank, this is how I remember it, kind of into a cloud bank, and then ending up in a very pastoral place. It was very green and park like, 
sort of could have been kind of forested or just, you know, like a really nice park sort of thing with an entity who was, uh, for want of a better word, interviewing me, kind of having this chat. And I don't remember the details of the personage. I can't describe them to you exactly. Uh, other than just that um, everything had a very natural energy to it, like you experience in nature. Uh, and I felt very comfortable, very safe. And it it seemed rather serious. It seemed like we were having a pretty serious discussion. <laughs> and hashed out, I guess, some important things. Um, but uh, about 20 hours, 18 to 20 hours in our time in real time, I regained consciousness in a hospital with my head heavily bandaged, hooked up to some machinery and a nurse in the room. And uh, that was the extent of my, uh, my, my absolute memories, my definite memories about, about do it. You, um, do you remember what the chat, what the chat was? Because you said you had a forced return is that's that, that's my third near death. This is oh, my that's first near death okay. experience. Okay. So the thing with the out of body experience, like I had that first time, is that that will change you very seriously. Right. And and um, it's hard to get the genie back in the bottle, so to speak, because one becomes aware that it, it, what is going on here is not what you always thought it was, kind of which is that I didn't really expect that my life had any expansiveness. I thought that I was in this body and I was living this life and that was it. And so this uh, demonstrates this kind of spiritual technology that I'm talking about, that we are occupying two worlds at one time in a way. We have our foot in another world, one world or the other, kind of, uh, based on the forms that we're taking at this point who I am is taking a particular form. So the spiritual technology that I think is revealed by an out-of-body experience, I call it lessons of spiritual perspective, which is that insight to realize our authentic lives as energetic, extra-dimensional, diaphanous energy beings, so, so to speak, eternally alive in this boundaryless, fundamental field of divine consciousness. Um, which is that love, that being enveloped in love, that kind of a matrix of loving intelligence and uh, miraculous infinite potential, kind of, you know, where it's sort of anything can happen if you know how to operate it in a way. And we are always functioning in that. Uh, so when I'm knocked out of this body and into the next world, so to speak, I am still in that fundamental field of divine consciousness it's just i have less limitations i have fewer limitations because i'm not in human form anymore but and you're still allows, you and i was still me i was still seeing out of my eyes i don't remember having hands and stuff like that but i was seeing out of my eyes right so i could report on it um and it allowed me to become a, a compassionate witness um i didn't really learn how to do that for quite a long time but this is one of the lessons of spiritual perspective that I've taken away is that I can be a compassionate witness to myself and to other people struggling to grow uh, within the limits of human perception, you know, kind of trying to escape this thing that we're in here, the way that we're stuck, the overwhelming human sensory experience. And I can um, sort of willfully engage and disengage in the material demands of this world because of that. Because I know that I can sit up and outside of myself and witness this plane as an energy being. And that when I'm in it, then I am subject to the way that the material world works on me and through the filter of being a human being. And uh, so I call it, I talk about divine consciousness as filtering through this unique spiritual package of karmic data that each of us is, right? Based on genes, experiences, our connections, uh, the body we're in, the way we look, the way we interface with things. 
And so we're constantly creating and fulfilling our karma through this vehicle, right? I'm, I'm expressing where my karma has brought me through this body in this life, through this form, and we all are. So I can compassionately identify with everybody as being this, their own spiritual package of karmic data needing to express itself, needing to channel divine consciousness through my form, through your form, right? Wow. That's so And that's what I call spiritual perspective. Yes. And that enables you to live in a re very, very different way. Because now you can see that somebody who, who might appear to be an enemy is really somebody who's suffering and trying to express something that has happened to them. And you just happen to be there to witness it. Right. So we become a witness and not a judge, a witness. And to myself, I can, I can look at myself in a much healthier way too. Like, oh, that's why I always do that same stupid thing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay. You can, um, it's a gift of perspective. It really is. And, uh, so that was a, that was my first one. And, you know, that indicates this kind of spiritual technology at work that is extra dimensional in nature, but applies to every, to life. I mean, I was always living. I was always alive. I was, and my next, my next NDE talks about that because that was a life review, right? Um, I had been living a fairly wild life in New York City at the time, uh, I'd witnessed the death of an aunt, and when I was living in San Francisco, I witnessed the death of an aunt that was really important to me. Um, my wife and I at the time had just completed a year-round trip of visiting all kinds of spiritual places in the world. We quit our jobs and went traveling, and I did not feel like I was a spiritual person, but I'd had these sort of momentous things going on in my life. That were informing my spiritual life. Um, the marriage broke up uh, after my aunt died. I I felt uh, very disconnected in a way, and I thought that there was one thing that I what I really needed to do was to go to New York and become famous and live a life as a successful artist and all these things that that um, would make up for it somehow. You know, would would make it all right. And, and so I did that and I was successful and uh, ran around in some, you know, interesting circles of people and had kind of a wild time and stuff. But it led to uh, drug and alcohol issues that then caused on one particular night this kind of um, collapse of my well-being, of my systems. And I had this, this experience with sort of cascading loss of consciousness. Where I was, I, if you know what fainting feels like, it stretched that out over about an hour or so. And that's how long it took for me to finally make it home and then just fall out on the floor of my apartment and have all of uh, the sensation from the bottom uh, and the, from my neck down really just go away. I, I was basically numb. I was sort of paralyzed from the neck down. And my girlfriend at the time was over, kind of over me and kind of hollering and upset and stuff like that. But she faded out and the whole room filled in with this dense, brilliant white cloud, this radiant, brilliant light. And once again, I was in that same place that I had been years before, where I was enfolded in love. I was sort of boundaryless. You know, all of it opened up again to me. And it was like, oh, that's right. This is a great place to be. <laughs> yeah. I'm not stuck in my body anymore. That didn't really occur to me at the time. But I did feel like somebody was behind me again. And like they directed me to look in a certain, you know, look over here. And it, this white cloud. and. A, this part of it opened up like a screen kind of in the cloud. 
but not like a movie screen, more like a box of time, kind of, that I could sort of reach into or enter into an experience. Mm -hmm. And it started replaying these episodes from my life. And it was, uh, if anybody has ever heard me talk before, I say this every time, it wasn't the greatest hits. This was, it was not a highlight reel. These were incidents where I had not been present appropriately, where I had overlooked something very important, or where I had an opportunity presented to me that I couldn't see, um, where I was injuring someone and didn't know that I was causing that much injury because I was too self-centered at the time. And um, it went on that way, as I recall, for about four or five of these sort of episodes, these seminal, life-changing episodes, kind of. And I have, in the uh, intervening years, recalled uh, parts of some of them. Um, but I, once again, I don't really use that so much in telling my story because just the whole occasion is already pretty miraculous right and and the fact that i was shown these parts of my life that we can all relate to we all have those parts of, of life that we may have wanted to forget about but then presented to me in this way that i felt like i was participating in again all the same feelings you know uh, about it. wow and so i call that uh, the lesson of spiritual presence um from near-death experiences, when people have time re uh, life reviews, it always takes some wild kind of format. I've heard people talk about uh, seeing a row of shimmering pools with a different scene in each pool, that kind of thing. Almost People like almost a bank of TVs with a hundred images at once that are seen from their life. Others that are more like mine, that are these episodic, like entering back into this. And some people, it flashes before your eyes. Life flashes before your eyes kind of thing. And all of that suggests in terms of the spiritual technology, this kind of experiential spiritual technology. And you may have noticed this in human life, that time is much more than just the linear biological process that we can perceive. And you'll notice that sometimes it goes really fast and sometimes it goes really slow. Right? And so it, it, it's kind of like, time is kind of like an internet where all knowledge always exists. This collective field of every eternal moment, a living record of the karmic actions and conditions we create and will account for it. will account for it. Um, and I learned the profound potential of every moment, the power of my conscious or unconscious participation in this moment right now, because we always live right in this moment. This is when it's all happening, and when it always can happen. We, we can consciously engage knowing Every one of these sort of box of times, these, each moment that we're living in, is the only moment where we are affecting the creation of our reality right in here. Every moment is the living window into uh, the entire opportunity of life that you have to be uh, open-heartedly present for because love and miracles and the creation of our karma are alive in every single instant, right? So... Uh, I call this a lesson of spiritual presence because the life reviews don't mean that there is a miracle life out there for you someday in another realm. It means you're living it now. We're in it now. We're going to change forms, but all of this spiritual, spiritual technology is the same thing, only expanded after this. So. That's a lesson of spiritual presence from the second near-death experience, and and um, not a not a great experience. After a, a while, you know, the the cloud dissipated, and I saw my girlfriend again screaming and crying, and I started to feel my hands and feet again, and I left New York and moved to Arizona, 
left the relationship, tried to, you know, find some way to start over and have things work. And it continued to be successful uh, professionally, but less was functioning appropriately in my life. You know, I was having a harder time just being this, just being Robert. Um, so the, the third one, then, the forced return to life happened when I was in Arizona and I was going to get married again. And I was with some friends watching a Super Bowl game, a Super Bowl Sunday, in a college town in, in uh, central Arizona. And I went out to, uh, to call uh, my girlfriend, and I was assaulted by a skinhead, which there were groups of them kind of around this town, you know, the big kids with shaved heads and sort of neo-Nazi uh, types. And I had basically just come from New York. I was going back and forth quite a bit. And I looked, I guess, a little too urbane <laughs> for these guys. And so um, they, so this guy assaulted me. And it kept going on for long enough. I talked him out of it, and then he came back, and he got more violent. And I had been trained as a martial artist as a child in my childhood for years. And I made a terrible mistake where when he was really assaulting me violently, I planted my back foot and I punched him right on the chin and knocked him out cold. And the people around me in this um, in this sort of shopping mall type thing appl actually applauded, like you know he deserved it. Uh, right away, I knew that something was not good <laughs> about it. And I left immediately. I got on my bike and I started riding back uh, to my girlfriend who was at home baking. And I didn't realize that there was a van of these guys who had pulled up and witnessed this incident. And they drove up alongside of me and hit me in the back of the head with a crowbar or a tire iron, something like that and knocked me headfirst into the curb, and I was unconscious for about two and a half or three hours. Immediately, I was, well, not as immediate as the other times, really. It was a little bit, I had a little more sense of what was going on in the physical world, but I was transported into this other kind of dimension, but it was much more sort of subterranean in nature. Again, I felt this release and this relief like I was enfolded in love, but it was definitely a more womb-like kind of thing. And there were entities around me in a circle. I couldn't tell you how many. It seems like maybe six or seven or something like that. And I don't remember that. I can't define them for you. I can't tell them exact, tell you exactly who they were. But I was um, very happy to be there because I knew that something bad was happening outside. Kind of. There was crunching noises, <laughs> and oh. they were they were kicking and stomping on me, and stuff like that. Uh, and I ended up in pretty bad shape. I had a lot of fairly major injuries and required surgery and stuff. Uh, so I wanted to stay there, but they were telling me that I had to go back, and I struggled against it. I did not want to go back, but they kind of all insisted, and they picked me up as I remember it. This feeling of being lifted by multiple hands, kind of, so there's more physicality in this one, and then being kind of like pushed through this membrane. And I popped back out and I opened my eyes. I was on my back with an emergency med medical worker over me who was bandaging my head. And he said, He's back to the other emergency medical workers with him. And that the forced return to life thing was hopefully, knock on wood, my last near-death experience. <laughs> my least favorite if you have to have such a thing. Uh, but it did inform me, um, and this is how the spiritual technology works, the spiritual technology that reaches into this world works, is that I'm here for a reason. I'm here for a particular spiritual purpose. Um, so it informed my ability to to realize my authentic self, too, because nothing I thought I was mattered. Getting beaten up that badly, I think, put me into a place of sort of absolute humility. Right. 
where everything that I thought I was and how important I thought I was and all that stuff was gone. And I now was fragile and on my own. And I understood that I need to participate more seriously in this world of being human, of the limitations and the joys and the sorrows, the kind of suffering and stuff to grow and evolve towards uh, this kind of plan or this kind of goal, uh, this kind of purpose that I need to show up. And, you know, having been a very self-centered sort of guy who wanted to be a, uh, wanted to be famous and stuff like that at one point in my life, I had always imagined uh, my life as being sort of like a big budget uh, superhero movie or with Yours truly is the superhero, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and what I discovered was that it was really more like an amateur handheld documentary, low budget, <laughs> with me as one of the characters in it, mm-hmm. kind of right. And so my my purpose may not be as grand as I think it's supposed to be. In fact, it probably is not as grand as I imagine, fantasize it should be. But it's very, very important to my karma, to the karmic circle of this life, the things that I need to uh, accomplish here. And that might, might mean just showing up for people, being of service to people. I like to say that, that, that our overall purpose is really to remove the obstacles to love in our life right? and in the world, you know, to act responsibly and beneficially for others, for the planet, to be consciously engaged in it, as I learned from my previous one, in the moment, yes, present. right, with this kind of perspective that I'm just I'm in this form experiencing these things and people ask me well, i don't know what my purpose is how do i know my purpose what do people need you to do for them what do people love for you to do like for you to do? what do you love what do you care about it's all right there it's all right in front of you my wife and i moved from new york city after 30 years of living there uh, to uh, to California because I grew up in California and my mom is just a couple hours away and I just got back from visiting her. She's 90 years old now. That is part of my purpose. Obviously, that's part of my purpose. And so it may not be this bigger thing that you think where you imagine yourself on TV or something like that. Right. It may just be that you need to show up for people that you love to learn what it is that has prevented you from being able to channel love through you, to recognize love coming towards you, to see love in the forms around you, right? To bring the solution to the world um, and express divine consciousness, simply which near-death experiencers experience, like I did, as this field of love that unfolds us. So. That's the uh, that's the third one. Um, now, in a larger picture, you know, that started to make me wonder about what the, what that all means. And these lessons, these kind of this kind of spiritual technology that's indicated by that. Um, that there's all this world of stuff that's always changing. That I'm a part of, but that I'm not a part of. You know, that I'm I'm outside of extra dimensionally in many ways. And there are scientists that can demonstrate to you how extra dimensionality in this world works all the time. We're subject to kind of more rigorous standards than a lot of science, but there are mountains of evidence. Um, Like Dr. Bruce Grayson, for example, who you mentioned from the University of Virginia and the the explorations of of childhood reincarnation. Yes. 2,700? 2,800 cases, something like that, of childhood reincarnation, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I started to get really, really interested in, uh, in scripture and in you know, philosophy 
and in um, uh, physics, quantum physics and the like. And the thing that kept coming back in all of these different, uh, yeah, I started reading a whole bunch of and everything I read, what kept coming back is that we are inhabiting this material world where things are coming and going. All the, they're changing all the time. And yet underneath it all, there is what I call divine consciousness, this fundamental field of being that it really helps to learn how to just contact at any moment. Because then when things are crazy around you, you can touch bases with that. Everything that comes and goes and changes is not real. I mean, it's real, you know, I do have to pay my bill, that kind of thing. But it's not real in that deeper, more profound sense that what does not change in every eternal moment is real. And what we experience from one life to another, there's this kind of groundwork or framework. Um, I was reading about it in like uh, Buddhism and Sufism and Gnosticism and stuff like that. There's a couple of quotes. One of them here I want to read from the Dhammapada. Free from imaginary negative ideas, detached from changing surfaces, in touch with our eternal ground, the wise are not subject to outside agitations and always live in a kind of bliss. If I detach and become a witness, not a judge, I'm in touch with that elemental divine consciousness, that ground of being. The stuff's going to come and go and change around, but I'm okay with that. Yes. Um, Krishnamurti said once, um, I don't mind whatever happens. <laughs> this is a pretty <laughs> bottom line rule of thumb. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a pretty big statement. <laughs> and then I love, uh, I love Rumi, the, the great Sufi poet. Uh, and in the, the second book, How to Get to Heaven Without Really Dying, Coleman Barks gives me his translations, uh, gratefully, um, for the section on Rumi that I write about. That book has talks about uh, how this eternal moment never changes and never has through all of history. And so we can read the teachings uh, from, you know, pre-Christian times right. or from indigenous cultures. And they're all saying the same thing, right? and they and they're all valid right now, all of them, because it's always been the human experience that it's channeling it through. Um, here's one from Rumi where he says, "Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there, where the soul where the soul lies down in that grass. The world is too full to talk about language, ideas." Even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. Right? So we escape this delusion of separateness. The sense that I am me and that's it. We're all me. We're all it. Right? So yeah, I started wondering when I heard different uh, near-death experience stories. Uh, why are they different? What are the similarities, that kind of thing? Because all near-death experiences have similarities and variations. They're based on archetypes and culture and religious iconography, you know, and karmic experiences of life. Um, each near-death experience is humanly perceived and then reported back, right? I didn't die-die. I'm back here, and I'm telling you as a human. So I have to use this kind of pattern recognition that as a human you'll understand um so the end of this life is not really the end of illusion or this in the sense that if people live completely different lives in this world we live completely different lives in other worlds too we will so we learn that this kind of near-death experience afterlife is custom made within this divine consciousness this field of infinite potential and it's conditioned by our karma, what we think and feel about ourselves in the universe, what we bring to it. Um, karma, which is an old idea, it just means action, if you translate it, the word action, uh, is something that I, I really believe in. I really bought into completely. 
formed by actions that create or remove obstacles to love. Um, obstacles that we might create between us and divine consciousness, the unwillingness to listen to the, the small, quiet voice within kind of thing, as, as uh, Quakers would call it, the, the small, still voice. Right? Um, and also by, and you'll hear this with the manifestation, sort of the gift movement and stuff, is by um, how you think and feel about uh, yourself, how you can realize your potential to utilize elements of spiritual technology in each moment to have things work out a certain way in your life, to have certain things come to pass. Um, or, we're always experience our karmic state of being engaged by what we've made, what we're making, and what we can make of our lives, and being shown what we need to guide our spiritual evolution all the time. If you're if you're awake to it, if you're aware, if you're woke, so to speak, <laughs> we are always connected to a spiritual Wi-Fi. And it really just kind of matters how good a reception you're getting, what good how good your your Wi-Fi connection is. Because if you're open to it and you're you're considering this kind of spiritual perspective and this this timeless moment that I'm engaged in and the fact that I have some kind of karmic purpose, then this Wi-Fi is coming through fairly loud and clear all the time. And there are human characteristics and and uh, principles that are. Uh, consistent throughout things. The, uh, Near-death experiences always have this field of pure love. Yes. People always experience the field of pure love. Some people, as we mentioned earlier, have hellish experiences, and those are custom-made as well, too. Oftentimes, they do result, though, in the person experiencing this field of pure love, being enfolded into it. But most NDE people, it's like right away, you're in this like I was there is this realization of boundarylessness, of transcendent unity, of everything being the same thing, you know, kind of feeling apart, feeling enfolded in. There are elements of radiant illumination, energy light beings, clouds, brilliant lights at the end of the tunnel, all of that kind of stuff. Um, there's that this acknowledgement of the karmic instruction aspect of it that I was talking about. Um, there's eternal renewal. There's rebirth sort of thing. Springtime always comes around. We are die. We are born again. Sort of thing. So much shamanism in this. A lot. Yeah. Of it. yeah. Well, yes. all of these things are the same thing. Yes. All, all interconnected. Mm -hmm. Yes. All and then there's things. synchronicity, too, where you have these things that are just too meaningful to be absolute coincidence happen over and over again. And, and you know, Jung noticed it so often in his academic philosophical studies, um, psychological studies, that he had to write a small book about it that was a, called it an a-causal connecting principle, synchronicity. He coined the name, the term. And it happens to everybody. It happens to us all the time. And if you are open for it, uh, if you if you willingly and consciously open up your connection, your Wi-Fi connection, so to speak, synchronicities ha start happening all the time. Mm -hmm. You start to see things that are just like, oh, my, that's another one right there, isn't it? And it's like, yes. And then you hear this voice in your ear kind of, yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You're starting to get it. <laughs> It's so true. <laughs> so if we just touch base with any of these things, with pure love, with this, any kind of sense of transcendent unity that we can realize the world is one big, beautiful thing, uh, the illumination from a child's face or from the sun bouncing off of a river or a lake or something, um, somebody that you respect and admire giving you this kind of karmic instruction or some experience teaching you a, a profound lesson, um, this understanding that things are renewing, that this is not the end, that this too shall pass, and that something will come out of this, 
And then the fact that it's all joined together in a way that I can't really quite understand right. from this limited perception. I have a misperception problem as a human being. <laughs> you know? But if you, if you recognize that at any time, you can kind of re reboot into your, you know, this moment of experience. Go, oh, the sun is shining out there. That reminds me that I'm part of this transcendently unified field that's about love, that's about renewal, right? <clears throat> and the best ways to get to those, the, those places where it really starts to expand on or create heaven in your life. And so like I said, heaven is not a, an address, but a state of being. Um, as a human being, uh, you can think, once again, I tend to think in very grand terms, like I'm really going to accomplish some huge thing. Well, I like out of nowhere, I don't even know how it happened. I got published with two books about all of this stuff. Right. And it, that happened when I was 58 years old. So I had no idea any of that was going to be happening to me at all. But what I came to recognize is that I can, I can live in that, that uh, heavenly place, that little piece of heaven, and I can expand it to those around me and project it into the world by, by having those principles, having those characteristics that people in heaven would have by being kind, by showing kindness, right? by being honest which really simplifies your life in a very big way. <laughs> you don't have to juggle cats, you know, all the time. Um, by being humble, by um, not realizing who they don't realize I am. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> How dare you don't know who I think I am? Right, you know? right. You get rid of all, you lose all of that, who I'm supposed to be, and just be the I am, not this or that. I am this or that. Just be the I am part of it, that shared experience. So humility, kindness, honesty, humility, forgiveness. I know how to forgive you because I have needed to be forgiven. Yes. Right? And that lets me put down all the luggage and maybe help you carry yours a little bit, and you can help me carry mine a little bit. It's a whole different experience in life. Um, by showing compassion, by recognizing that the one, that grounding reality of our shared experience, you know, something that doesn't change is that we are all sharing this experience. We're all part of the same thing. And then by service, by being of service, by volunteering or showing up for your sick aunt or helping a neighbor, uh, you know, uh, taking the spotlight off yourself and uh, showing up for others. So through kindness, honesty, humility, forgiveness, compassion, and service, you can create heaven within this spot, right in this moment, and then expand it. You know, when you're kind to people without being catty, you know, being authentically kind, the world changes. Yes. You discover there's all kinds of kind people that have sort of been waiting for you to get on the beam. With you know, you walk, you see the friend in Sufism. They call it the friend. You walk into a room and it's like, oh, that's kind of a bad vibe in here. And then somebody catches your eye. You're like, right. <laughs> there you are, right? That's your karma partner. You know right away. Now your Wi-Fi is, you know, your Wi-Fi fills up. Yeah. And you're able to use these sort of simple techniques and principles to access the spiritual technology that's at work in our lives. Um, in my talk, I wrote down what, what being spiritual technology savvy does for us. It gives us the means to honestly discover and remove our obstacles to love, to compassionately detach and witness the struggles of human life, to recognize the sacred in all of life, including the earth itself, and to transcend the human misperception of separateness, where we can realize life doesn't happen to you, it happens for you. We can flip that script 
a lot of us who are spiritually minded will have this problem where I know I'm a spiritual being, but I only really experience it in little fits and starts, you know? Right. I'm blissfully connected for a minute and then all the junk starts coming in and I forget about it and I get caught back up in that again. And I am a human who occasionally has moments of spiritual connection. We can flip that script and recognize that we are spiritual beings alive in this matrix of loving intelligence, with limitless potential that are at times having to experience it through the filter, the limitations of being human. I love that. I love that idea. That's, it changes everything. It does. Yes. It literally does change everything. Yes. Just it from changes that everything. Right. All the things that you thought were so desperately important in one minute, you realize they're not really, if it's all right. <laughs> you know, because you don't have to worry about it all so much. And then it's just showing you that you just have to show up in a certain way. And it also keeps you present, kind, compassionate. Right. And you say forgiveness and also forgiving yourself when you do have these moments of, as David Lorimar says, bumbling around and like, I can't believe my mind is even thinking that right now. Right. Then you can or doing something patently destructive over and over again. Right. So, right. you know, if you, if you can't identify with this divine conscious consciousness, this grounded being, you're only stuck in yourself. You'll never get out of it whether it's drinking and drugging yourself to death or whether it's just having to mansplain everything. <laughs> it's still one of my There's that ginger problems. thing again. <laughs> and of course, the ways that we have, uh, um, we have two applications in terms of, in technological terms. We have two apps that we can use for this, meditation and prayer. And they're easily downloadable they're available to anybody, right? And when you meditate, you become you can become a witness to your thoughts. You can escape that voice of the ego that's generally negative. Try to replace it with a positive ego voice, or listen to just that intuitive intelligence, that still small voice that arises, and you can start to experience that kind of transcendent unity of life too. When you meditate. It's like uh, the order at the Buddhist hot dog stand, right? <laughs> uh, make me one with everything. <laughs> so meditation, I, I meditated a lot for a long time, and I recommend it highly to everyone. I write about it um, in both books, too, um, about how to, you know, what to think about when you're not supposed to be thinking, and right. stuff like that. Because it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but it is the most rewarding thing in the world to do. But as you do it, you miss it if you if you don't, for sure. Yeah. Well, and I also think that you can do it until you get to a point where you're sort of on the other bank. Right. Um, I oftentimes, I feel kind of free and clear of a lot of the baggage that I used to just have to drag around with me all the time. You know, I, I can sort of instinctively set that down. And not have to be there. And it, it improves in my my focus, my presence for other things. You know, all of this stuff that sounds crackpot and like you're not going to be tuning into re the real life if you do this. You know, which is the, the kind of complaint you hear from materialists. You know, yes. oh, you're not living in the real world. Uh, the fact is that this is the real world that I'm talking about. That's not that you have a big job or that you have a big car. Well, somebody can run into your car and you can get fired tomorrow. So if we know that's not it, <laughs> right? Right, right. And yeah. isn't it interesting when you said it in your third near-death experience, um, you just talk about suffering a little bit and vulnerability, that there you were all of a sudden just so vulnerable. You didn't say vulnerable, mm -hmm. but you said something very similar. and there's something to really be said for that. Well, I what that, it really was, was teachable. Yes. Even as painful 
And I think that's the hard part is when a tragedy, like maybe your aunt or a few of my situations, you know, and if you can stay in this world, it's still very, very difficult, but you remember and you understand and using all those tools helps you to, to just awaken i mean it's it's so difficult but you, yeah you come out transformed for sure if, if that's the path you decide to take pain and suffering happens to everyone everybody gets that path and it is not fun and it's not easy you know and it, it's really funny because i had those three near-death experiences and i still didn't get it in a way i was still trying to cling on to what i <laughs> thought i was supposed to be and stuff <laughs> And it, it wasn't until I had this experience at, at the 9-11 this is where it was kind of, you know, uh, paranormal. So it's like I realized I was sensing this, that I was you know, enveloped in this kind of tumultuous storm of souls sort of around me and stuff. And I couldn't deny it anymore. And then I took up a meditation practice. Um, that's when it changed for me. And in a, in a way, this is what death is. We don't just die once. We die many times. And we die many times in one life. And we die in many ways. Um, my, my late uncle, by marriage, is a, a famous author and philosopher, a Jungian psychologist named James Hillman. And um, in a book of his called Suicide and the Soul from 1961, I remember this one uh, paragraph leapt out at me when I was thinking about uh, the role death plays in our life. He said, without a dying to the world of the old order, there's no place for renewal because it's illusory to hope that growth is but an additive process requiring neither sacrifice nor death. The soul favors the death experience to usher in change. So when I die from childhood into being a teenager and then into young adulthood and then to middle age and then to old age, when I lose a relationship uh, that was critical to me, it's gone. When uh, my parents die, uh, when I get fired, you know, these things put you back in that place that I found myself where I, I just couldn't pretend anymore. I needed to find the real ground, my authentic center, so that I could start over, so that I could take what I had learned from that and become what I could be. I had to die to experience heaven. And you do, really, right. have to die to experience heaven. Right but also in this life over and over again. And I, from the deaths that I had, none of which were prolonged and you know painful for a long time, they happened fast to me. I died quickly. Uh, it was a much more pleasant experience than I've had many times staying alive. Right. It was just like stepping into another room, yeah. you know? Just starting an old coat, yeah. Yeah, so NDEs teach us that there is no death and that every death, of every kind of death, is a rebooting, a renewal facilitated by spiritual technology as death reduces us to the ground of profound humility, a state of grace that dissolves our ego attachments, our misperceptions, and those things imposed on us by fears and instincts, and we become, like I did, teachable spiritual growth becomes possible and we can realize our authentic spiritual self without having to be anything to anybody else, without having to work within the limitations of human misperception, but to have that greater perspective, that understanding of presence, and that realization of purpose that I'm here for a reason. You know? That's the... Uh, it's That's the, the talk about spiritual technology, basically. And I, I hope that everyone there can um, can identify 
with it. If you just go into that moment in your life when you uh, knew a little piece of heaven and analyze it a little bit. Yes. Where were you? What was going on? I think that some of the things I've been talking about should resonate with that experience. And if you enter into that experience and open up kindness, humility, honesty, forgiveness, compassion, service, then you oh, it's like, it's here. You know, the, the kingdom of heaven is spread across the world, and I can see it. Right. Yeah. I have the eyes to see it. And how profound to, you know, we did have, didn't really talk about your childhood, but how profound for children to live in a world where their caregivers, the adults, the society are living with that spiritual technology even more intact than in, you know, as we said, flip the, flip the switch, if you will, what, how it would change humanity. It's a game changer. It's a game changer yeah. anyway, but even more so to have mentors and and people like that as a little, as a child, and throughout your life. Wow. Yes. Yeah, and that's got you know that's got to be you got to chalk that up to karma, right? Yes. Yes. I did not have that growing up. Uh, the the adult world around me was very unreliable and threatening a lot of the time, and so. That kind of struggle was something that I needed. I needed to get my butt kicked seriously three good times that I can think of. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to say, uh, "Don't follow my example; just take my advice." Right. You know? right. Well, I guess that also has to do with duality. I know I had Susan Giesman on the show, and I can sort of be an idealist at times, and. And she said, she said something. She said, no matter how much of the spiritual technology that many people, and I hope at some point it's the majority <laughs> of this world, it might be the majority when you look into indigenous cultures and third world countries and, and everyone, it probably is. But, and the poles. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and the poles. Um, but there, there has to be duality. And duality in the sense that we choose these lives and many of the lessons before we come here and what you just said that for some reason that you used that you knew and you'll remember you had to go through those lessons. That's that's yeah. too. Right. And we are living in two worlds kind of at the yes. same time. But now each of those worlds can be a number of different things, you know. Mm -hmm. Your your human world can be completely different from my human world or somebody else's human world. And likewise, we know from this wide variety of near-death experience, your afterlife worlds can be entirely different too. Right, right. You know, so. Wow. Well, that is, thank you for a very thought-provoking <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Robert, that was amazing. I just, I... I listened to it a few times, and now I every time I listen to you, I just get more out of it and get a little bit teary every time I. And so, thank you, thank you for Thanks bringing so much. That to means a lot room. to me. Oh, um, I, I really mean that. And um, so, if people, well, first of all, is there is there anything else you would like to like to share? <laughs> Shared a lot. Yeah, no, that's that's probably enough of the actual material uh, for most people to observe. I do have a question for you. If you could take a walk with your six-year-old self, what would you say? Well, that's that's a funny and interesting question for you to ask because I had the experience, kind of an astral travel experience in a sort of meditative moment where I was walking down the hallway in the house I grew up. And I could look into the room and see the little boy sitting there. And he was drawing on pieces of lined index paper, you know, which is what I did when I was a child to yes. escape and how I ended up being able to make a living in this world. And I was able to go in and tell him that it wasn't him, that he was not to blame that this was just the nature of the people around him. It was really a lot of the same 
the sort of lessons that I came to later that I've been talking about. But I've had this years ago, this kind of spontaneous astral event kind of uh, happened with me. And um, that was basically what I told them was that uh, these people are doing what they have to do. You know, you know, you witness somebody expressing what they need to express because that is their karmic package of data. That's the only thing they have. And they're filtering it through this body, this experience, these genes, right? And so um, it helped me to um, forgive right. them, you know? Yes. It helps me every day. That helps me every day to forgive the world for being such an awful place sometimes, you know? It, it is. Right. All the time it's an awful place, and all the time it's a beautiful place, too. Right. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what I would say is that um, we each have our own purpose. You know, they have theirs and you have yours. Um, this is how it's supposed to be. Life's not happening to you. It's happening for you. Right. Um, so that's what I would say. Wow. It's kind of what I said. I don't know. I don't remember hearing that when I was a kid. I don't remember some guy coming in my room <laughs> and telling me that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Robert, thank you so much. And um, if people want to find you, how would they? How would they do that? Uh, well, my blog is robertkopecky.blogspot.com. Uh, my website is robertkopecky.com. Um, Robert. At Robert Kopecky3 is my Twitter, where I post uh, notifications of new blogs because I'm always writing new blogs. And I, I get a lot of a lot of people there and I put up put up I think a lot of interesting stuff. So then. And I got a Facebook author page. Uh, if you go to my blog though, you can directly get in contact with me if you would like. If you want to consult or if you'd like me to speak or something like that. And you can get my books there. I, I can sign them for you that way, or you can, there are links to buying them online. Well, thank you so much. This has been such a, just a beautiful conversation. And I really appreciate your, your time and your, and your energy and your love and your presence and your compassion and, and all of that. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> thank you so much, Marla. It's re it's really been great. And uh, thanks to everybody out there who listens to this. And I hope you got something from it. And contact me if you want to. Okay. Thank you. Have a great evening. You too. Thanks. Okay.